Hi guys this is Hirasaki. This story is all about what if Naruto was the bodyguard of Azula. Naruto is banished from Konoha, but gives them the slip and boards a ship. Soon after, he is shipwrecked on Ember Island and is saved by Azula. Three years later, Naruto is Azula's bodyguard while she hunts for the Avatar, but did he see the last of Konoha? Before we start kindly like and subscribe to this channel, and look over the description box for the author of this amazing storyline. Welcome aboard. Chapter 16, To Dream and to Convict. Location, Ba Sing Se. They had landed on a small island in the middle of the lake. Due to his weeks on his own, Appa was had some trouble readjusting to carrying multiple people on his back. Everyone else wanted to take a break, so they agreed to land on the island. I missed you more than you'll ever know, buddy, Aang told Appa, once again hugging his forehead. Momo did the same thing. Appa just responded licking Aang with his tongue, making him laugh. Hey, Arrowhead. Called out Shuyi. Enough with the hug fest, we've got more important things to worry about. Shuyi is right, Sokka said. We should go to the Earth King and tell him our plan. We're on a mission here, and we cannot delay any longer. Akela barked in agreement. One good hour after weeks of trouble isn't much of a role, Katara told him. Him. She would barely call it a step. Sure, they got Appa back, but that was one good thing against a lot of other things. A role is a role, Asuma told her. You just have to build on it. Sometimes, that was what a person needed to achieve victory, to keep moving. Speaking of roles, Choji said. Does anyone have any food? Shikamura handed him some jerky. Here, eat this. Thanks. Look, Saka told his sister, if we want to invade the Fire Nation when the eclipse happens, we'll need the Earth King's support. That was the whole idea of coming to Ba Sing Se in the first place, before losing Appa and trying to get around Long Fong happened. What makes you think we'll get it? Toph asked him. I don't know if you've noticed, but things don't go that smoothly for our group. Usually, they encountered problem after problem. It does not matter if what your plan goes smoothly or not, Gara told her. It only matters if your plan works. That was what mattered in the end if the plan worked or not. Gara, Long Fong is control of the city, Katara told him. His conspiracy with the Dai Li is too powerful. I think we should just keep flying and leave this horrible place behind us. I'm with sweetness, Toph agreed. I've seen enough of Ba Sing Se. And I can't even see. She threw her hands up to emphasize her point. She felt a bop on her head for those words. Don't be a downer, Toph, Shuyi told her, despite getting a glare from the blind earthbender. We can turn this around. And don't worry about the Dai Li, Saka said confidently. I've got that covered. He still had that ace. Aang joined the group once he was done getting reattached to Appa. And now that we have Appa back, there's nothing stopping us from telling the Earth King the truth. About the conspiracy in the war, he said to them, to them all. Saka supported what the Air Nomad said. It's the whole reason we came here in the first place. We have to try. If they didn't try, what was the point? Katara thought it over. Well, I guess if the Earth King knew the truth, things could change, she reasoned. Things could change for the better. I don't trust the new positive Sokka, Toph said as she stood up. Long Fong brainwashed you, didn't he? She accused, pointing a finger at the tribesman. Hey Temari, can I borrow your iron club? Shuyi asked the Suna Kunoichi. I think the resident rockhead needs a harder whack on the head. It's not a club, it's a fan, Temari retorted, sounding a little offended by those words. And yet, you have used it as a club, Kankuro commented. He had seen her use it like it was giant club, hitting her enemies away. Do you want me to brain you? She threatened, reaching for her fan. He pointed an accusing finger at her there? 
You see? That's what I'm talking about. Tamari, stop threatening to brain Kankuro, Gara told her. Kankuro, stop antagonizing Tamari. Sorry, Gara, the two said. You know what the funniest thing about this is? Ino said to her team. He's the youngest. She would have thought that the elder siblings would be pressing down on him. But instead, it was the other way around. Ino, you're not helping, Shikamaru told his teammate. Aang saw something in the water. He ran closer to the shore to get a better look and saw that it was a couple of ships. They were far away, but close enough for those on the island to see them. That's probably the Dai Li searching for us, Saka said as the others joined Aang in looking at the ships. Then let's fly. Katara declared, having made her choice. And fly they did. Aang had Appa pour on the speed as they flew back towards the city city. Due to the lack of a saddle, everyone had to hold on for their lives, an idea that didn't really appeal to some, but exhilarated others. Can we please buy a new saddle? Toaf begged. Riding bareback is terrifying. All she could see was Appa, and at the speed they were going, it wasn't helping her. Are you kidding? This is great. Shuyi whooped. She had never flown on a sky bison before. She loved every single minute of it. They flew to the center of the city, heading straight for the Earth King's palace. There it is, Saka stated pointing at the building in the center, while also holding on to to Akela, who shared Toph's opinion of riding bareback. That whole thing is the palace. The Earth King's chamber should be in the center. We have to be careful, Katara told them. Long Fangs probably warned the king that we're coming. What makes you say that? Shu Yi asked. It seems to me that we're going to fly nice and look out. She screamed the last part as a boulder almost hit them. What was that? Tof demanded. Surface to air rocks. Answered Sokka as he looked down and saw earthbender teams from the royal guard with rocks at the ready. More incoming. As he spoke, more and more of the rocks the teams had were being thrown at them. Tamari, can you help? Gara asked as Appa began to do evasive maneuvers to avoid the rocks coming at them. If we were flying straight and steady, yes. She answered. If they had that, she could send those rocks right back at them. But since they weren't, she, she couldn't. The royal guards kept launching SARS at the Sky Bison. One looked like it was about to hit Aang, but he shattered it via earth bending without even looking at it. Another came at him, this he split it in half using his staff. Seeing that another batch of the royal guards was waiting to attack them when they landed, he leapt from Appa and landed on the ground. As he landed, he bent the surrounding tiles to heave the soldiers up into the air, as well as scattering them. It only left the captain, who was sitting an armored ostrich horse. All Appa had to do to scare him off was growl. Everyone else got off Appa, and they made their way forward to the palace. On both sides of them, royal guards lined and bent cubes of earth at them. Aang, Tof and Gara worked together to destroy the cubes, Aang using his staff, Tof using her earth bending and Gara using his sand, while still moving forward. Katara and Kankuro cleaned up shop in the back. Katara used her waterbending to knock the royal guards down while Kankuro used chakra threads to slam royal guards into each other. Sorry. Katara apologized as she hit guardsmen after guardsmen. In front of them came more guardsmen. Tof took care of them by earth bending the tiles to flip over and pin them. Sorry. We just need to get through to see the Earth King. Would you stop apologizing? demanded Shu Yi. It's weird. They made their way to the palace. In their path was a river, with three bridges connecting one side to the other. The other side held the stairs leading up to the palace. While guardsmen gathered on the other side of the river to stop Team Avatar, the next level on the staircase also had royal guards. The guardsmen worked as one and bent two badger mole statues off the ground and hurled it at Team Avatar. 
Both Aang and Toph manage to block the two statues by earth bending the tiles to form a shell over them. The two statues shattered against the shell, but it held. Katara was the first to move out of the shell and towards the river. Bending the water out of her pouch, she bent it into a thin half bridge made of ice. Using the ice bridge, she leapt over the guardsmen there while also bending water out from the ri river. Swinging her foot in a kicking motion, she bent the water to push the guardsmen into the river. Then she bent it into a water whip and pulled the guardsmen from the next level on the stairs into the river as well. As this occurred, the others made their way across the bridge while Aang leapt over the river and froze the water with air bending, trapping the guardsmen there. Everyone gathered but quickly turned their heads above as rocks started to rain down on them. There were also guardsmen coming down the stairs. Tof stepped forward and raised her hands, making the earth rumble. As a SAR smashed beside her, she drew her hands back and bent the stairs leading up to the palace to flatten into a ramp, making all the guardsmen on the stairs to slide down. Aang and Toph then bent a chunk of the ground to lift everyone to the stair-turned ramp. They went up the ramp, they passed all the guardsmen who had been caught on the stairs, and who were now sliding down to the ground. Seriously, we're actually on your guy's side. Sokka told them as they went past. But the only thing they could answer were screams of surprise and pain. Sorry, the tribesmen finally said after watching this for a few minutes. Oh great, now you've got the ice chewer apologizing as well. Shuyi accused Katara. They reached the top of the staircase, where two groups of royal guards were waiting. Aang and Toph both reacted by pushing them away with earth bending. In there. Sokka told everyone as they charged into the palace. They soon entered a junction that had three other exits. More guardsmen entered but were easily defeated when Toph bent the floor to shoot up into columns and pin the guardsmen to the ceiling. Sokka and Shikamaru paused to look around. Toph, which way to the Earth King? How should I know? She asked. You're the one who can see everything with feet, Tamari told her. She had, he had seen the blind earthbender move around without running into anything before. I agree, although I'm in favor of splitting up to cover more ground, Shikamaru insisted. Not all of us will need to go in one direction. Well, I'm still voting we leave Ba Sing Se. She continued to demolish the guardsmen that kept coming. Saka and Shikamaru decided to check every door. They didn't have much success. Saka opened one door and saw that it was a woman's dressing room, which already had a woman in there, dressed, thankfully. After she had fainted, Saka closed the door and apologized. Zuko and Iroh entered their apartment, getting back from Lake Laogai. You did the right thing, letting the Avatar's bison go free, Iroh told Zuko. Zuko staggered away from the door. I don't feel right, he said. His vision of the room blurred. He tried to clear it by blinking, but that didn't help. Turning his head, he saw a familiar face, one that had died at Akawan. Sheng, what are you? He collapsed to the ground, breaking a pot in the process. Zuko! cried Iroh as he rushed over to his fallen nephew. They had managed to beat all the royal guardsmen, while also causing a bit of a mess in the process. Sokka climbed over some debris and saw a big, fancy door that was untouched. Now that's an impressive door. He declared. It's gotta have to go somewhere. He looked over at the resident earthbenders. Aang, Toph, would you mind? The two went to the door and knocked it down. They all ran into the room, which turned out to be the throne room, which was quite big. Beneath a giant badger mole statue at the other end of the room sat the Earth King. Standing in front of the Earth King was Long Fong and a group of Dai Li agents. Everyone prepared themselves for a fight. We need to talk to you. Aang declared to the Earth King. They're here to overthrow you, Long Fong told the Earth King. No, we're not. Shuyi shouted. We're on your side, Sokka said. We're here to help. You have to tr trust us. Katara agreed. 
The earth king stood up from his throne. You invade my palace, laid waste to all my guards, break down my fancy door, and you expect me to trust you? He asked them like he couldn't believe what they had just said. He has a good point, Tof pointed out. We weren't exactly expecting a warm welcome, Choji told her. We were right too, Ino agreed. They had been expecting resistance to try and stop them, the evidence of that was right behind them. If you're on my side, the Earth King told them. Then drop your weapons and stand down. Everyone shared a look when they heard those words, but they complied. Aang dropped his staff, Sokka dropped his machete, Katara bent her water back into her pouch, and Toph bent the rock she held back into the earth. Sokka, Choji, and Ino put the kunai they held away, while Asuma did the same with his chakra blades. Shui lowered her fists, Kankuro put his hands down, and Temari folded up her fan. Gara simply folded his arms. See? Aang said to him. We're friends, your earthiness. Really, Arrowhead? Asked Shuyi. Your earthiness? That probably one of the dumbest nicknames she had ever heard of. I guess the Avatar did not receive a lesson on how to address someone above his station, Choji commented. Aang and Katara glared at him for his comment, even though they both agreed that it was sadly true. The Earth King did nothing. Long Fong, however, did do something. He simply raised his hand, and the Dai Li agents bent their rock gloves at the group, cuffing their hands behind their backs. Long Fong gave a smug smile. Detain the assailants. He ordered. The Dai Li slid forward to the group, intent on following their orders. They were about to grab them when Sand blasted out of Gara's gourd and grabbed the, the Dai Li agents. If you move, the sand will crush you, he warned them. His arms and hands might be trapped, but he could still use his sand. Don't kill them, Gara. Tamari told her little brother. If you do, more might be summoned. And if that happened, they would really be in trouble. A few daily they could handle. All of them would be stretching it. Very well. The sand released the agents and flew back into the gourd. The Dai Li rushed behind them and grabbed their shoulders. We're your allies. Sokka tried to tell the Earth King as he struggled to get out of the Dai Li's grip. Make sure that the Avatar and his friends never see daylight again, Long Fong commanded the Dai Li. Even though he didn't show it, he was silently smug about what just happened. The Earth King was surprised at what his man said. The Avatar? You're the Avatar? He asked Sokka. Sokka looked at Aang. No, he's the Avatar. Over here, the Air Nomad said, bending his arms free of the rock cuffs and raising them before putting them back into the cuffs. You could do that at any time. Shuyi demanded. You could have broken us out of these things. He gave a sheepish laugh. Sorry, didn't think about it. She rolled her eyes in exasperation. You are an idiot. What does it matter, your highness? Long Fong asked the Earth King. They are enemies of the state. Perhaps you're right, the Earth King agreed. Meanwhile, his pet bear had padded over to Aang and licked his face, making him laugh. Though Bosco seems to like him, he idly commented. The bear sniffed the air and then turned to face Shu Yi. He sniffed the air again, gave a grunt of excitement and ran into Shuyi, knocking her to the ground. To the surprise of everyone, he didn't maul her. He kept nuzzling her and grunting with happiness. Get off of me, you furry lump. She shouted, trying to wiggle out from under the bear. Bosco! Shouted the Earth King. Bosco got off Shuyi, allowing her to stand up. What in the name of all the spirit? spirits was that about? She shouted at the bear. Why did you suddenly try to squish me? How do you even know me? The only bears I know are that one mother bear and her. She trailed off as she looked at Bosco. No way, you couldn't be. She looked at the daily behind her. 
Hey, get these things off of me. She wiggled her arms. No, the agent answered. Oh, relax. I'm not going to attack you. I want to check something. Now get these things off. Let her go, the Earth King ordered. Long Fong had a small look of surprise on his face, but quickly suppressed it. The Earth King had never interfered with what he did, and he never ordered the Dai Li before. The Dai Li agent bent the rock cuffs off. She walked towards the bear with caution. She stretched her hand towards Bosco and laid it on his head. When he didn't react, she brought the hand to his left ear and gently turned it over so she could see the back. On the back of the ear was a little patch of white fur shaped like a star. You brown, overgrown furball. Was the first thing out of her mouth before she tackled him to the ground, hugging him. This is where you've been all this time. Restrain that girl. Long Fong barked out. The Dai Li pulled her off the bear and recuffed her. The bear moaned quietly in disappointment when he saw this. You know Bosco? The Earth King asked her with genuine curiosity. Most people who met Bosco thought he was a freak of nature. But she reacted like he was an old friend. Know him? Shu Yi repeated. I've slept with this bear. Silence reigned in the throne room. Okay, that came out wrong, she admitted. What do you mean, slept with? Eno asked her. That needed some clarification right away. You guys remember that story? About how I spent a winter with a bear and her cub? Asked Shu Yi. Everyone, minus the San siblings, nodded. Meet the cub. She looked at Bosco, who waved a paw at them. This doesn't matter, Long Fong said. Take them away. Wait, I'll hear what they have to say, the Earth King declared. When they heard those words, the Dai Li stopped what they were doing and waited. His advisor frowned ever so slightly. Ng stepped forward, silently volunteering to be the spokesperson. Well, sir, there's a war going on right now, he started to explain. For the past 100 years in fact. The Dai Li's kept it secret from you. It's a conspiracy to control the city and to control you. A secret war? Asked the Earth King. That's crazy. Wouldn't he have been the first to know if there was a war going on? Completely. Agreed Long Fong. Long Fong didn't want us to tell you, so he stole our sky bison to blackmail us, and continued. And blackmail is the least of his crimes, he brainwashed our friend. The man in question turned to the king. All lies, he said. I've never even seen a sky bison, your majesty. Frankly, I thought they were extinct. The earth king sat back down in his chair. Your claim is difficult to believe. Even from an avatar, he told Aang. Long Fong stepped up to the side of the throne and bent down slightly. These hooligans are part of an anarchist cell that my agents have been tracking for weeks, he whispered into the Earth King's ear. If you listen to them, you're playing right into your own destruction. The Earth King was silent for a minute, thinking over all he had just heard from everyone. I have to trust my advisor, he finally announced. Ang looked shocked as a Dai Li agent grabbed hold of him. The rest of the agents began to pull them away when Sokka made his move. Hey, can you do me a favor? He asked the Dai Li who was holding him. Reach down the front of my shirt and pull out what you find. The Dai Li did as he was asked and pulled out the Paragon Medallion for the rest of the Dai Li to see. You get the point? Saka asked. Yes sir, the agent replied, only the faintest traces of shock and surprises evident in his voice. He certainly had not been expected to cuff one of his superiors. It went against everything he had been taught. When he quickly looked at his fellow agents, he could see they had not expected it either. Then shouldn't you be releasing us from these cuffs? He and his group were released from the rock cuffs almost immediately. Thank you. He turned to the Earth King. 
Your Majesty, I can prove he's lying. Long Feng said he's never seen a sky bison. Ask him to lift his robe. What? I am not disrobing. Long Feng retorted. The Earth King looked at his advisor with suspicion. It was a simple request, albeit an unusual one, and if he was innocent, why would he object? Gara simply narrowed his eyes. The sand shot out of his gourd, flew over to Long Feng, and flipped his robe up over his head, revealing a mark on his left leg. Right there. Called out Aang. Appa bit him. Never seen a sky bison, huh? Sokka asked. Akela had a wolfish grin. Long Foam pushed his robe down. That happens to be a large birthmark. Thanks for showing everyone, he told them all. Well, I suppose there's no way to prove where those marks came from, the Earth King said. Of course, there is, Sokka told him. They brought Appa into the room and had him open his mouth. Aang pointed at the teeth and then at the mark on Long Feng's leg. Yep, that pretty much proves it, the Earth King said. Team Avatar, minus the Shinobi, who were professionals and kept their opinions to themselves, got excited. But it doesn't prove this crazy conspiracy theory, he told them. Team Avatar, minus the Shinobi, who were professionals and kept their opinions to themselves, groaned. Though, I, I suppose this matter's worth looking into. Long Feng just scowled and walked away, the Dai Li following him. They had to make a few adjustments and they had to make them fast. But even as they walked, some of the agents looked briefly back at the tribesmen. Zuko lay in bed, sweating. Iroh sat by his side. You're burning up, he said as he pulled a cloth out of water. You have an intense fever. This will help cool you down. He put the cloth on his nephew's forehead. So, thirsty, Zuko croaked. It felt like his throat was on fire. He tried to sit up, but his uncle made him lay back down. Here's some clean water to drink. He pulled a ladle out of a bucket and held it against Zuko's mouth. Stay under the blankets and sweat this out. Zuko yanked the ladle out of Iroa's hands and gulped it down. He reached for the bucket and drank the two, spilling some of the water. When it was empty, he threw the bucket against the wall and lay back down. So, this is what a train is like? The Earth King asked. I didn't realize it would be this, public. He stood in the middle of the train car with royal guards behind him. His presence was shocking to the people in the train. So, you've never been outside the upper ring before? Katara asked him. It was something she was having a hard time believing. I've never been outside the palace, he answered. It was a whole new experience for him. When he looked out the window, he smiled. Now that's the way to travel. He pointed to Aang riding Appa. So, may I ask where we're going? He asked them. Underneath Lake Laogai, your majesty. To the Dai Li's secret headquarters, Sokka answered. You're about to see where all the brainwashing and conspiring took place. They rode the monorail out to the same station as before, and made their way to Lake Laogai. Once they were there, Toph brought the causeway and entrance with her earth bending, only to find it destroyed. It's gone. She said. The Dai Li must have known we were coming and destroyed the evidence. Katara stated. She couldn't believe that they had gotten there first. H.M., that seems awfully convenient, the Earth King told them, a frown on his fa face. If anything, this proves the conspiracy exists even more, Sokka said to him. Long Foam was right. This was a waste of time. He couldn't believe that he agreed to follow them. If you'll excuse me, I'm going back to the palace. He turned around and started to leave. Crap. We need to show him something that'll convince him, Shu Yi told the others. If they didn't, Long Foam would win, and they would be back to square one, if they were that lucky. The wall. Realized Katara. They'll never be able to cover that up in time. 
It was too damn big for that to happen quickly. Ang leapt up into the air and landed in front of the Earth King. If you come with us to the outer wall, we can prove to you that the secret war is real, he said, pleading with all he could. No Earth King has ever been to the outer wall, the Earth King replied. I don't have any more time for this nonsense. He continued walking up the hill. If you come with us, this time you can ride on Appa, Sokka offered. It stopped the Earth King in his tracks. Well, that got his attention. Asuma commented. But he couldn't blame the man. Flying on a sky bison was an offer very few could refuse. He's going to take the offer, Gara stated. Are you sure about that? Kankuro asked his little brother. Yes. The Earth King did indeed take the offer. His screaming could be heard throughout the agrarian zone. First time flying? Asked Tof as she held onto Appa's fur. It's both thrilling and terrifying. He answered. Yeah, I hate it too. Right now, she was holding onto the sky bison for dear life and silently praying to whatever spirits would hear her to let her live. I have to be honest with you, he told Aang once he had calmed down some and was able to think again. Part of me really hopes that what you're telling me about this war isn't true. I wish, I wish it wasn't, Aang told him. But the fact remained. The war was real, and he needed to stop it. The fever was causing Zuko to dream. In his dream, he sat in the throne room of the Fire Lord. His hair was long and held the headpiece of the Fire Lord. The left side of his face held no scar. Standing at attention in front of him were soldiers of the 41 Division. Two dragons, one red and one blue, appeared and started to circle around him. It's getting late, the blue dragon said in Azula's voice. Are you planning to retire soon, my lord? I'm not tired, Zuko said. He felt just fine. Relax, fire lord Zuko. Just let go. Give in to it. Shut your eyes for a while. His eyes began to droop until the red dragon spoke. No, fire lord Zuko. Do not listen to the blue dragon. You should get out of here right now. Go. Before it's too late. Sleep now, fire lord Zuko, the blue dragon whispered in his ear. The throne room disappeared. The soldiers collapsed, revealing to be nothing more than suits of armor. Zuko looked around but only saw darkness. Then a pair of eyes flashed in the darkness, revealing the blue dragon. Sleep, just like mother. It lunged at him, opening its mouth wide. The blue dragon disappeared, but Zuko heard someone else. Zuko. Help me. His mother's voice cried out. But before he could do anything, the floor ate him alive. In the real world, he started to sweat again. The sun was setting when they reached the outer wall. It's still there. And cried out as he pointed at the drill, which blocked off by a wall as big as it. What is that? The Earth King asked, shock lacing his voice. He couldn't believe what he was seeing, he didn't even know what it was he was seeing. Seeing. It's a drill, Sokka told him. A giant drill made by the Fire Nation to break through your walls. They landed on the wall and looked down at the drill. I can't believe I never knew, the Earth King said. He had been led around by the nose and he went along with it willingly. As he stared down at the drill, he felt like a fool. It is not your fault, Gara told him. You were blinded by a rat that wanted power and control over this city and you. The Kazekage could see that the Earth King was a man who had placed too much trust in an advisor who wanted to control him. He could also see that if he was given some proper lessons and training in how to rule, he would make a decent ruler. They heard an earth elevator coming up, revealing long foam and two daily agents. I can explain this, your majesty, long foam told him. This is nothing more than, a construction project. Really? Asked Katara. 
Then perhaps you can explain why there's a Fire Nation insignia on you little construction project? The insignia was there for everyone to see. The Earth King eyed him suspiciously, waiting to hear his reply. Well, it's imported of course. You know you can't trust domestic machinery, his advisor replied, trying to smile the problem off. I call bull. Complete and utter bull, Shu Yi declared. What he had just said was stupid to say. If he knew about the war, why would he say that? I'm with her, Choji agreed. Yeah, same here, Temari said. It's pretty stupid to import machinery from a country you're at war with, Kang Kuro said. There is no war, Long Fong told them, a small skull on his face. You might as well stop, Gara said. There is no way you can get yourself out of this one, Eno told him. He had cornered himself with that last explanation, and they had him on it. Surely you don't believe these children over instead of your most loyal attendant? Long Fong asked the Earth King, turning the attention back, back to him. The Earth King wasn't sure what to do. Seeing that his confidence was failing, Saka spoke up. Your Majesty, if you will not take care of him, I will. Long Fong scoffed at the notion that sentence carried. You don't have that kind of power, boy, he told the tribesmen. He wasn't sure what happened in the throne room, but he was certain it was a fluke. As a matter of fact, I do. Dai Li. The Earth King placed a hand on his shoulder. No, Saka. I will take care of this. He turned to Long Fong and the Dai Li agents. Dai Li. Arrest Long Fong. I want him to stand trial for crimes against the Earth Kingdom. He commanded. Both Long Fong and Team Avatar, minus the Shinobi, who were professionals and kept their opinions to themselves, and Saka, who saw it coming, were shocked at what the Earth King had said. The two Dai Li agents shared a look and then cuffed Long Fong with metal shackles. You can't arrest me. Long Fong protested. You all need me more than you know. The Dai Li agents pulled him away. All right. Cheered Shu Yi. Long Fong is long gone. That could have been better, Eno commented. It had sounded cheesy to the Yamanaka. Hey, it was the only one I could think of, she replied, trying to defend what she had said. I probably would have said the same thing, Saka told them. See, the ice chewer agrees with me. He frowned at those words are you ever going to stop calling me that? No, she replied with a straight face. A slow, almost mocking, clap was heard on the wall. Very impressive, your majesty, Naruto's voice rang out as he walked out of the nearby command post. It's nice to see you finally grow a backbone. He stopped and stood before the group, completely relaxed and confident. Who are you? The Earth King asked as the royal guardsmen moved in front of him. No need to, to panic, boys. I'm not going to attack him, the blonde told the guardsmen. As for who I am, pardon my rudeness. He bowed. I am the paragon of the Fire Nation and bodyguard to the Princess Azula. My name is Naruto Uzumaki. And in case you already haven't figured it out already, the war is real. I've been fighting in it for three years. Why are you here, Naruto? Asuma asked. His chakra blades out and ready to use. If the blonde was going to make an attempt on the Earth King, it wouldn't work. You know him? The Earth King asked, surprised by that, it was a day for him to be surprised. He used to be one of us, a shinobi, Choji explained to him. That is, until he was banished. I think you mean until I left, Naruto replied easily. The old hag never actually banished me, so technically the shinobi present could legally capture or kill me and collect the bounty for it, although I don't know how much bounty would they place on someone like me. He looked over to where Gara and his siblings stood. It's good to see you back among us, Gara, he said with a somber tone. Naruto, Gara greeted. There were no other words to say or that needed to be said. 
You didn't answer Asuma Sensei's question, Naruto, Ino spoke up, getting his attention. Why are you here? Oh, it's simple. I'm just getting rid of the trash. He turned to face the edge of the outer wall and walked towards it, stopping a few steps before the edge. You might want to give me a little more room. This is the first time I'm actually going to use this thing. He held out his hand and concentrated. A blue spinning orb began to form in his hand. A Raisingan fought the Kanoha Shinobi. They were surprised by the fact he could do it with a single hand, having thought that he needed a clone to, to help him with it. And now for the next step, he muttered. For large, white blades formed on the orb and everyone heard the very air itself being cut. Here we go. He leapt up into the air. If anyone had paid attention to his eyes, they would have noticed that they were crimson red instead of blue. Futon, Raisin Shuriken, Wind Style, Spiraling Shuriken. He cried out as he seemed to hover and the then he threw the jutsu down at the drill. He threw it. How can he throw something that dents with chakra? The shinobi thought to themselves. They had never seen anything like that before. The jutsu hit the drill, and that was the last they ever saw of said drill. An explosion shaped like a giant sphere formed, obscuring everything within it and lashing out with violent winds. When the sphere disappeared, there was nothing left of the drill or the low wall blocking it off. The only thing left was a very, very deep crater. Naruto landed back on the wall. Well, my work here is done. Bye. He walked away as everyone else was still looking at the crater. Everyone was too stunned by what they saw to try and stop him from leaving. They managed to regain their wits and decided to head back to the palace. By the time they regrouped in the throne room, night had fallen. I want to thank you, young heroes, for opening my eyes, the Earth King told them. They stood before the throne. Bosco lay next to Shu Yi, who absently scratched his ear. All this time, what I thought was a great metropolis was merely a city of fools. And that makes me the king fool. He covered his eyes with his hand. We're at war with the Fire Nation. He was still having a hard time believing it. That's why we came to Ba Sing Se, your highness. Because we think you can help us end the war, Saka told him, walking forward. Akela padded forward as well and sat on his haunches. We don't have, have much time, Aang said. There's a comet coming this summer. Its energy will give the firebenders unbelievable strength. They'll be unstoppable. But there is hope, Saka continued. Before the comet comes, we have a window of opportunity, a solar eclipse is coming. The sun will be entirely blocked out by the moon and the firebenders will be helpless. What are you suggesting, Saka? The Earth King asked. It sounded like the tribesmen had a plan, but he wasn't sure. That's the day we need to invade the Fire Nation. The day of Black Sun, he told the ruler of the Earth Kingdom. Oh, that's a good title, Shuyi said. Not bad, Shikamaru agreed. It was both dramatic and ominous. The Earth King thought it over. I don't know. That would require moving troops out of Ba Sing Se. We'd be completely vulnerable, he told them. Not to mention the power the Fire Nation Paragon wields could easily destroy the troops. You're already vulnerable, Saka said to him. The Fire Nation won't stop until Ba Sing Se falls. You can either sit back and wait for that to happen or take the offensive and give yourself a fighting chance. And you also do not need to worry yourself about Naruto, Asuma said, trying to assure him. If he tries to attack us during the invasion, he'll be facing not only us, but also two other teams from Kanoha as well as the Kazekage and his siblings. He was certain that they would be able to hold him down if they threw everyone against him. The Earth King contemplated the information he was given, staying silent. It still sounded like a risky plan to him, but they did have good points. Very well. You have my support, he announced, sending Team Avatar, minus the Shinobi, 
who were professionals and kept their opinions to themselves, into victory cheers and aim going around on an air, sco air scooter. Your Majesty, a voice spoke out. An Earth Kingdom general walked in and bowed before the king. I apologize for the interruption. This is General Howe, the Earth King explained. He's the leader of the Council of Five, my highest ranking generals. We searched Long Feng's office, General Howe said, raising his head up from the ground. I think we found something that will interest everybody. That got everyone's interest. They made their way to Long Feng's office. When they got there, a chest was presented to the Earth King. There are secret files on everyone in Ba Sing Se, including you kids, General Hao told Team Avatar. The exceptions seem to be you seven. He looked at Team Asuma and the San siblings. We're not from this side of the planet, Asuma told the General. Information about us would be sketchy at best. Tof Bei Fong, the Earth King read one of the scrolls. He handed to Tof, who handed it to Katara. She opened it up and read it. It's a letter from your mom, she told Tof. Your mom's here in the city. And she wants to meet you. Long Fong intercepted our letters from home? Tof asked before shaking her head. That's just sad. The man had truly been paranoid. Aang, the Earth King handed him a scroll. This scroll was attached to the horn of your bison when the Dai Li captured it, General Hao explained to the Air Nomad. Aang opened the scroll. I it's from the Eastern Air Temple, he told everyone as he continued to read it. Is there a letter for me in Saka, by any chance? Katara asked, silently hoping for one. The Earth King looked through the chest. I'm afraid not. Saka and Katara were disappointed by that piece of news. But there is an intelligence report that might interest you, General Howe said as he handed them a scroll. A small fleet of water tri tribe ships, Katara read the scroll's contents. What? Saka asked as he looked over her shoulder. That could be dad. Protecting the mouth of Chameleon Bay, led by Hakoda, Katara continued reading. It is dad. Way to go, you two, Shuyi said with genuine happiness. You know where your dad is. That reminds me. The Earth King pulled out another scroll. Shuyi, this is addressed to you. It seems to be from your village. He held it out for her. What? She took the scroll and opened it. It's from the village leader. He says that the village will welcome me back with open arms now. She told them. As she read, she began to tremble. That's great news. Congratulations, Shuyi, Katara told her. Yeah, you must be happy that your village wants you back now, Ino agreed. Shuyi was still trembling and hadn't said a word. Shuyi? Aren't you excited? Aang asked. Those spirits damned, egoistical, rockheads. She yelled, fury lacing her voice. Everyone there then realized that she wasn't trembling with happiness, she was trembling with rage. They want me back? After all this time? Arg, I hate them. She stomped over to the fire and threw the scroll into it. What's the matter, Shuyi? Asuma asked as the scroll burned in the fire. They only want me back, because I helped the Avatar destroy the drill, she growled. They want me back because I'm famous now, not because they want me. Feeling her side being nudged, she turned and saw Bosco at her side, worry and concern shining in his eyes. She fell to her knees and hugged his head, crying freely. Why? Why can't they just want me back for me? Why do they think I'm so useless? She asked the bear. No one really knew how to answer her. You should know that this is not a natural sickness, Iroh told Zuko as he poured tea. But that shouldn't stop you from enjoying tea. He fed the tea to Zuko. W.H. What's happening? Zuko asked. Something was going on with him, and he didn't know what it was. He felt like he was, changing. 
Your critical decision, Iroh told him. What you did beneath that lake. It was in such conflict with your image of yourself that you are now at war, war within your own mind and body. What's that mean? You are going through a metamorphosis, my nephew. It will not be a pleasant experience, but when you come out of it, you will be the beautiful prince you were always meant to be. He placed another cloth on Zuko's head. Team Avatar, as well as the Shinobi, regrouped the next morning in Long Feng's office. Shuyi was sitting against Bosco's side. Akela took a nap at Sokka's side. I can't believe it, Aang said as he reread the scroll. There's a man living at the Eastern Air Temple. He says he's a guru. What's a guru? A poisonous blowfish? Asked Sokka. It sounded like it was a name for a fish. No, a spiritual expert, Aang explained. He wants to help me take the next step in the Avatar journey. He says he can teach me to control the Avatar state. He looked at the scroll again and frowned. But there's also writing here I can't read. Let me have a look at it, Shikamaru said. Aang passed him the scroll. He took one look at the writing, and his eyes widened. What is it, Shikamaru? Choji asked his friend. He simply handed the scroll to Gara. It's addressed to you, he told the Kazekage. How would someone we've never met send a letter to Gara? Tamari asked. But Shikamaru didn't have a good answer for her. Gara read the scroll until his eyes went wide as well. This guru says that he can help quiet what remains of Shikaku. He says he can help me finally sleep, he told his siblings. What? Are you serious? Kankuro asked. Gara handed him the scroll. Read for yourself. Well. Tamari asked as she looked over her brother's shoulder, trying to see what was on the scroll. He's right, right. That's what this guru guy says, the puppeteer shinobi told her. That was great news for their little brother. Who's Shikaku? Shuyi asked, the question getting everyone's attention, minus Team Asuma, who knew who Shikaku was. Um, well. Tamari tried to come up with a good excuse but couldn't find one. Up until recently, I had something of a different personality, Gara explained to Shuyi. If I were to fall asleep, the other personality would take control of my body. We called this other person Shikaku, and he was often insane and bloodthirsty. Whenever he took control, a bloodbath was soon to follow. Whether it was friends or enemies did not matter. Recently, there was an incident that resulted in Shikaku disappearing. But a shadow of him remains. Every time I've tried to fall asleep, he is there, torturing me with memories of we did. Why do you say we? Aang asked him. He's the one who would gladly kill a person. That is true, but people did not see it like that. They did not know of Shikaku, so they thought I was a bloodthirsty monster, he told the air nomad. They were silent for a few seconds, taking in what he had just said. I think you should go, Gara, Kankuro said. This could help you. Are you sure? Of course, Tamari agreed. And we'll come with you. Gara said nothing, he simply nodded his thanks. He was silently glad that they would be coming. Well, I can't believe we know where our dad is now, Katara said, holding the scroll that had the good news. I know what you mean, Toph said, holding her letter. My mom's in the city. And from her letter, it sounds like she finally understands me. At least, she was hoping that was the case. This is all such big news, Sokka said. Where do we even start? There were so many places to cover, and he didn't think they could all go to them. Perhaps it's best if you split up, Shikamaru suggested. Split up? Aang repeated. We just found Appa and got the family back together. Now you want us to separate? He asked the Kanoha Shinobi. He has a point. You and Gara have to meet this guru, Aang, Katara told him, 
seeing the logic behind the suggestion. If we're going to invade the Fire Nation, you need to be ready. And Gara should be allowed to actually sleep. She had seen him stay awake all night, even when the others had gone to sleep. He thought it over, and he could see the logic as well. Well, if we're going to the Eastern Air Temple, Appa and I can drop you off at Chameleon Bay to see your dad, he offered the waterbender. Someone has to stay here with the Earth King and help him plan for the invasion, Sokka said. I can do that. Shuyu raised her hand. No, you're not going to stay and help the Earth King without someone watching you. Oh, come on, Ice Chewer. You still don't trust me? She asked. Bosco threw a glare at Sokka and growled at him. Akela opened his eyes and returned the growl. There's no need to worry, Sokka, Asuma told him. We'll stay here and keep an eye on her. And I will too, Katara said, standing up. I'll stay here with the king. Sokka, I know how badly you want to help dad. You go to Chameleon Bay. Sokka also stood up and gave Katara a big bear hug. You are the nicest sister ever. He declared with a giddy happiness. Easy there, big brother, she said, pushing him off. But you're right, I am. A servant walked into the room. The Earth King invites you to join for breakfast, he announced, before bowing and leaving the room. There's food? Shuyi asked, perking up. Bosco did the same thing and the two of them shared a long, silent look. I call dibs on the meat. She declared before leaping up and running for the door. Bosco grabbed her by the leg and pulled her back, letting him to run out the door. He didn't get far before Shuyi jumped on him and wrestled him to the ground, letting her take the lead. Everyone else was silent. I'm not the only one who saw that, right? Choji asked. Trust me, I saw it too, Ino replied. After getting breakfast, which included a food duel of sorts between Shuyi and Bosco, everyone gathered near Appa to say goodbye. Aang walked over to Katara, who was petting Appa. Katara, I need to tell you something, he said as he began to blush. I've been wanting to say it for a long time. What is it Aang? She asked. Before he could tell her, Kankuro slapped him on the back. Let's hit the air already, he said, earning a skull from both his sister and Katara. He became confused by the skulls he was getting. What? The Earth King walked down the stairs to join them. Aang, Sokka, Temari, Kankuro and Gara, he began. I wish you a good journey. Ba Sig Say owes you its thanks. We look forward to your safe return. They saluted the Earth King. Sokka began to climb aboard when a soldier walked to the king. Your Majesty. There are three female warriors here to see you. They're from the Isle of Kyoshi, he told the Earth King. That's Suki. Sokka said in shock, falling from Appa. You know these warriors? The Earth King asked. Oh yeah, he answered as he stood back up. The Kyoshi warriors are a skilled group of fighters, trustworthy too. They're good friends of ours. Then we shall welcome them as honored guests. Aang moved to climb aboard Appa. Wait, Aang, Katara said, making him turn around. She gave him a hug and a kiss, making him blush. I'm really going to miss you guys, Tof told them. Aang and Katara gave her a hug, a hug as well. They then gave Sokka a group hug. Noticing Shu Yi's downcast expression, Sokka decided to do something. Get over here, Shu Yi, he told her. She brightened up and gave them all a big bear hug. After the hug fest was over, the groups parted ways. Location, Zuko and Iroh. Zuko awoke from his sleep, the fever gone. He stood up and noticed that Iroh was still asleep. Making his way to the bathroom, he washed his face. Looking up into the mirror, he gave a shout of surprise and took a step back. The person in the mirror had Zuko's eyes, but had no hair, no scar, and had an arrow tattoo on his head. He looked a lot like the Avatar. Ah. Oh. 
He screamed as he woke up. He panted for a minute, his eyes wide. He placed two fingers on the scar and, for once in his life, was glad that it was there. Appa flew away from the outer wall. What did I tell ya? Sokka asked everyone on Appa as he lay on his back, absently scratching Akela's ear. A little positive thinking works wonders. We got the king on our side, we got Long Fong arrested, and when we get back, Suki's waiting for me. Yeah, girls are waiting for us, Aang agreed. Thanks, positive attitude. When did he get a girl waiting for him? Kankoro asked aloud. Tamari slapped him across the head. You were the one who interrupted their moment, she chastised him. Everything's gonna work out perfectly. From now on and forever, Sokka declared. Nothing ever works out perfectly, Gara warned the tribesmen. Be careful about what you say. Long Fong sat alone in his cell. A Dai Li agent came to the door. Dinner, he stated, pushing a tray of extravagant food through the bottom flap. Long Fong grabbed a piece of food. The Council of Five and the military are loyal to the Earth King. The agent said. But the Dai Li remains loyal to you, Long Fong, sir. Long, Long Fong raised an eyebrow. Is that so? Then why did that water tribe peasant ordered you to let them go and you obeyed? He asked the agent. The boy thinks he had control over us, but we are loyal to you, the agent repeated before leaving. Long Fong began to eat, a sinister smile growing on his face. Tof stood in front of a house. Taking a deep breath, she knocked on the door, and the door opened on the third knock. Hello? She called out as she walked in. Mom? Anyone home? She kept walking until she sensed something. But before she could do anything, a metal cage dropped on her, trapping her inside. Hey! Who do you think you're dealing with? One loudmouthed little brat who strayed too far from home, a familiar voice told her. It was Xi and Fu and Master Yu. The Earth King stood on a platform a line of royal guards stood on either side of the platform. Three Kyoshi warriors walked up the stairs and bowed to the Earth King. In our hour of need, the Earth King began. It is with the highest honor that I welcome our esteemed allies, the Kyoshi warriors. The Kyoshi warriors raised their heads, revealing them to be Azula, Tai Li, and Mai. We are the Earth King's humble servants, Azula said, her golden eyes looking at the Earth King. Chapter 17, To Meditate and to Separate Location, Ba Sing Se It was the start of a new day in their new apartment. Iroh was standing over the stove, cooking, as Zuko walked in. What's that smell? He asked, rubbing his eyes and yawning. It had been the smell that woke him up. It's Juke, Iroh answered as he stirred the pot. I'm sure you wouldn't like it. His nephew walked over to the pot and took a sniff. Actually, it smells delicious. I'd love a bowl, uncle, he said, holding up said bowl. Now that your fever is gone, you seem different somehow, Iroh noted as he poured some juke. I know, uncle. Uncle. I'm looking forward to this brand, new day, Zuko replied as he walked over to the table. We've got a new apartment, new furniture, and today's the grand opening of your new tea shop. Things are looking up, uncle. Iroh was shocked at what his nephew said, but he soon smiled. It may have been a trick of the light, but for a second, he could have sworn, he saw Zuko as a young boy sitting there instead of Zuko as a teenager. Location, aboard Appa. As they flew towards Chameleon Bay, Aang took a look. The area looked like a broken vase, with one cliff having two small cave entrances, giving it an appearance of a fossilized chameleon. That was how the bay itself got its name. The location is also suited for any guerrilla forces seeking to disrupt the Fire Nation's line of communications, as its waterways are often used by its navy for logistical purposes. You haven't seen your dad in over two years. Ng said to Sokka as he landed Appa on a nearby cliff. You must be so excited. Sokka, however, was trying not to throw up. 
I know I should be, he replied. But I just feel sick to my stomach. Akela gave him the this is not that hard look. He tried to ignore it. You do not need to worry, Gara said. Be glad that you are able to reunite with your father. He never really had the chance to know his. The tribesman calmed down when he heard those words. I guess you're right. Thanks, Gara. He looked at Aang. What about you? Are you nervous to meet this guru? Not at all, the air nomad answered. I'm ready to master the avatar state. I'll do whatever it takes. He looked back at Gara. What about you, Gara? Are you nervous? He shook his head. I just wish to put this shadow away. It had haunted him for far too long now. Sokka and Akela didn't waste time disembarking from Appa. See you in a week, Aang, Aang told them. Appa launched into the air and flew off, leaving them alone. Sokka turned to look at the tents on the beach. He felt a nudge against his side. Sorry, Akela. He took a deep breath. We might as well get moving. Both he and the wolf began to make their way to the camp. They entered the camp, getting the warrior's attention. Noticing the looks, Akela began to growl. Take it easy, Sokka told the wolf. They're friends. But he was nervous too. Would they treat him like a kid again, or as a man? They kept walking forward, until they were blocked by a warrior. However, he, as well as the other warriors, welcomed Sokka warmly. They soon parted, allowing him and Akela to head to the big tent. They entered through the flap, and that a council of war was meeting. His father, Hakoda, looked at the map in front of him. Batel was by his side and had noticed that Sokka and Akela had entered. He nudged Hakoda, who looked and saw his son. Sokka, he said. Hi, Dad, Sokka replied. Hakoda walked forward and gave him a hug, which Sokka returned with equal measure. Akela did nothing. He just sat on his haunches. Location, Ba Sing Se. Look, Bosco, the Earth King said to the bear. The Kyoshi warriors are here to protect us. Aren't you excited? Bosco just yawned. It's been a difficult week for me, he told the Kyoshi warriors. My most trusted advisor, Long Feng, and his Dai Li agents tried to take control of Ba Sing Se from me. It's terrible when you can't trust the people who are closest to you, Azula replied, kneeling in her Kyoshi getup. Mai and Tai Li sat behind her, wearing the same gear. But there is good news. As we speak, the Council of Five is meeting to plan an invasion of the Fire Nation this summer, on the day of a solar eclipse, the Earth King explained with an excited voice. Really? Asked Azula, her face not showing anything. Now that sounds like a fascinating and brilliant plan. Due to the, to the fact that General Fong's base was captured by who we now know as the Scarred Dragon, the launch point has been changed, General Hao announced as he and the other generals stood over the map. But nevertheless, in two months, the army and navy will invade the Fire Nation on the day of Black Sunday. He bent the Earth Kingdom pieces on the large map over to where the Fire Nation was. Momo leapt up onto the map and knocked down the pieces. Or we could send in Momo to do some damage, Katara said from where she knelt on the opposite side of the map, laughing. The generals did not laugh with her. Cause, the, sorry, she finally apologized. Never make jokes in a war council, Katara, Asuma told her from where he knelt by her side. It didn't help at all. General Hao bent the pieces Momo had knocked over back up, scaring Momo, who ran back over to Katara. All we need is the Earth King's seal in order to execute the plan. He bent a piece of the table over to where Katara, Team Asuma, and Shuyi knelt. Katara picked up the scroll and stood up. Everyone else followed her. I'll get these scrolls to him right away. Thank you, General Hao, she told him. They bowed and walked away. Location, aboard Appa. They approached the Eastern Air Temple, sailing through the air.
Aang could see that the air temple was just as ruined as the other two he had seen. But it did nothing to hide its beauty. As they came closer, he saw that someone was mediating alone. He had Appa land on the ground beneath the meditating man. UMM, hello? Called out Aang. Both he and Gara got off Appa and walked up the stairs, leaving Kankuro and Temari on the sky bison. You're Guru Pathak, right? The person who attached the note to Appa's horn that brought me and Gara here. Indeed, the Guru answered. I was a spiritual brother of your people and a personal friend of Monk Yatso. The man sounded wise, as befitting his age. Aang was briefly surprised at that revelation while Gara kept his face emotionless. In your note, you said you could teach me to gain control of the Avatar state, the Avatar said as they sat down. How? You must gain balance within yourself, before you can bring balance to the world, Puthik answered. And the first step to gaining balance is this. He handed Aang and Gara a cup each. Drink up. Aang tried to drink it, but spat it back out. It tastes like onion and banana juice. He complained. That's because it is. Puthik drank his cup. Yum yum. With that sentence, he seemed to become less ancient and wise and more youthful. The change astounded the air nomad. Gara lifted the cup to his mouth and drank it down to the last drop. How can you drink that stuff? Aang asked him, surprised that he could stomach it. I've drunk worse. He put the bowl down and looked at Puthik. Guru, he began. You know of Aang through your friendship with the Air Nomads and with Monk Gyatso. But how do you know of what I have been through? Why do you think you can help me? He wanted to know the answer. Puthik smiled. I've traveled all over the world, young Kazakage, he told the redhead. While it is a bit different from what she went through, I believe that the same method I helped Mito go through will work with you. Gara's eyes widened slightly when he heard that last part. You knew the lady Mito? He nodded. Of course, she was also a personal friend. Who is Lady Mito? Aang asked. It didn't sound like anyone he was supposed to know. Gara explained it to him. Lady Mito Uzumaki is the grandmother of Lady Tsunade, the Godame Hokage, and the wife of Hashirama Senju, the Shodame Hokage, and one of the founders of Kanoha. In a way, she is distantly related to Naruto. He turned to Puthik and bowed his head, while Aang's eyes widened after he had just heard this unusual bit of information about his enemy. To meet someone who had known them is tru truly an honor. Puthik chuckled. Ah yes, I knew Hashirama quite well. He and Mito loved each other very much. A genuinely interesting time to be around was when Mito was pregnant. Why? Aang asked curiously. One day, she was trying to kill him. The next, she was pranking him. He answered with a full-blown laugh at the memories. It is always interesting to watch a woman of the Uzumaki clan when she's carrying a child in her womb. Location, Earth Kingdom. Master Yu and Xin Fu rode a cart that carried the metal cage holding Tof. Eventually they came to a choice between two roads. I believe we need to go right, Master Yu told Xin Fu. What are you talking? Xin Fu replied as he stopped the cart. The Beifang estates this way. I'm quite certain you're mistaken. Hey! Toph called out, banging on the cage. Can you two old ladies quit your bickering for a second? I got to go to the bathroom. Oh, uh, okay, but make it quick. Master Yu took out a key and began to move towards the cage. Xin Fu grabbed his arm. What's wrong with you? He demanded. Oh, very sneaky, Toph, Master Yu said, realizing what she was trying to do. Nice try, but you can't trick me. He sat back down on the cart. Let me out of here so I can kick both your butts. Toph shouted at the two of them. Quit your banging. Xin Fu shouted back, banging the cage. 
You might think you're the greatest earthbender in the world, but even you can't bend metal. The cart started to move again. Toph didn't say anything. She just placed a hand on the side of the cage. Location, Ba Sing Se. Two of the Kyoshi warriors sat in front of a large mirror, cleaning off their makeup. They had been given a large, very nice place to live in Ba Sing Se for the duration of their stay. We've been presented with an extraordinary opportunity, girls, Azula said as she walked to the window. My finally gets to wear makeup that's not totally depressing? Ty Lee asked with agitated sarcasm. Mai, who's remaining consistent of red makeup beneath her eyes, making the appearance of someone who was either crying with blood, or had a bleeding face, looked at her friend. Her friend, Ty Lee was not one to use sarcasm, much less agitated sarcasm. I'm talking about conquering the whole Earth Kingdom, Azula told them, looking out the window. For a hundred years, the Fire Nation has hammered away from the outside. But now we're on the inside, and we can take it by ourselves. Gosh, you're so confident, Ty Lee said again with agitated sarcasm. Azula quirked an eyebrow but did not turn around. The key is the Dai Li, whoever controls the Dai Li controls Ba Sing Se. Ty Lee snorted. Like it's going to be that easy. My turn to her friend. What's going on, Ty Lee? She asked, starting to worry about her friend. Nothing, I'm fine, the acrobat replied shortly, obviously not wanting to continue the conversation. But her friend wouldn't let up. No, you're not. What's wrong? Nothing's wrong, okay? She almost shouted the question at her. Azula turned away from the window and walked over to the mirror. Something is bugging you, Tai Lee, she told the acrobat, her tone surprisingly gentle. We're your friends, you can tell us. Tai Lee tried to stay angry but couldn't. She let her shoulders slump in defeat. Sorry, guys. Something has been bugging me. Azula sat down on a nearby chair. What is it? You guys remember the swamp and who I met? The two other girls nodded. Well, the woman who I met was wearing the Kyoshi warrior outfit. And when she had started wearing the outfit she had taken, she began to worry but tried not to show it. So. Mai asked, not seeing where she was going with this. So, if that woman was me, what does that mean? Does that I'll betray you guys and end up fighting for the Earth Kingdom? Tears began to well up in her eyes. I don't want that. You guys are my only friends. I don't want to fight you too. She began to cry at the prospect of the idea. Idea. It scared her. It scared her very much. Both of her friends just sat there in silence for what felt like a couple of minutes. I could be wrong, Azula said drilly, but I think Naruto would be insulted by the fact you don't consider him a friend. Besides, if you what you think happens, it won't matter. Tylee stopped crying when she heard those words. What? Azula gave her a hug. Tai Lee, even if we end up fighting each other in this war, I will still consider you my friend. Same here, Mai said, joining the hug. Tears flowed down Tai Lee's face, but they were not ones of sadness. They were ones of happiness. They soon broke the hug and went their separate ways. I think I'm beginning to find my answer, Azula thought as she prepared to go to bed. She wasn't sure if she had all of it now, but it was a step. Location, Eastern Air Temple. Aang and Gara stood behind Puthik as he looked down at a creek. The sun had set, and the night life of the Eastern Air Temple had started up. In order to master the Avatar state and to be at peace with yourself, you must open all the chakras, Puthik told the two of them. Aang, Gara, tell me everything you know about chakras. What are chakras? Aang asked, rubbing his eye. He now only wore his pants and felt a little sleepy. The only time he had stayed up all night was during the whole tank train thing, which wasn't a fond memory for him. There's only one kind of chakra, Gara told the guru. He had removed the gourd, the belts and the vest, but kept the remainder of his clothes on. And unlike the air nomad, he was fully awake. 
This wasn't the first time he had spent the whole night awake. From a certain point of view, yes, Puthik replied. He turned to the pool of water in front of him. The water flows through this creek, much like the energy flows through your body. As you see, there are several pool pools where the water swirls around before flowing on. These pools are like our chakras. He stirred the water, causing the moss on the water to move around. So, chakras are pools of spiraling energy in our bodies? Aang asked for clarification. Exactly, the guru answered. If nothing else was around, this creek would flow pure and clear. However, life is messy, and things tend to fall in the creek. And then what happens? The creek can't flow? Yes. But if we open the paths between the pools. He lifted the moss at the exit. The energy flows. Aang exclaimed as the water flowed faster through the creek, taking all of the moss with it. Gara watched the water flow through the creeks. The eight gates, he said to himself. Yes, the chakras are similar to the eight gates, Puthik said, catching on to what Gara was thinking. The eight gates, what are those? Aang asked the Suna Shinobi. That was something he had never heard of before. Points in the chakra network, Gara explained to him. If opened, they grant the person immense strength and power. But the more gates you opened, the higher the price is. What's the price? Pain, the Kasekage answered shortly. If someone would open all the gates, they would have enough power to rival a Kage or possibly even you. But they would die in return. Aang could only gulp at those words. He couldn't even think of the kind of pain someone would get for each that kind of power. Puthik took them to another part of the temple, coming to a giant cavern. It was a wide, open place and fog surrounded where they sat. There are seven chakras that go up the body, Puthik told Aang and Gara, who sat opposite of him. Each pool of energy has a purpose and can be blocked by a specific kind of emotional muck. Be warned, opening the chakras is an intense experience, and once you begin this process, you cannot stop until all seven are open. His face had a serious ex expression that seemed to age him quite severely. Are you two ready? He asked them. Yes, Gara replied. Aang looked away for a brief moment, but faced the guru with determination in his eyes. I'll do whatever it takes, he answered. First, we will open the earth chakra, located at the base of the spine, Puthik told them. It deals with survival and is blocked by fear. What are you most afraid of? Let your fears become clear to you. Aang saw visions of the blue spirit, himself in the avatar state, Sokka being beaten by General Fong, Sozin's comet, and then finally, he saw the fire lord surrounded by fire, all tinted with the color red. He screamed in fright at what he saw. Gara saw memories of himself when he had lost control, butchering people because he wanted to see their blood. Stop it, stop it, he muttered to himself as he watched the memories repeat over again, always tinted red. No more, please just stop. Aang, Gara, your visions are not real, Puthik's voice spoke to them, breaking through what they saw. You are both concerned for your survival. But you must surrender those fears. Let your fears flow down the creek. Both Aang's and Gara's panicked expressions faded away as they calmed down and let their fear flow away. The images of their fear faded away as they heard a sound, almost like a chime ringing. You have opened your earth chakra, Puthik announced. He led them away from the cavern to behind a waterfall. Next is the water chakra? Asked Aang. It was rather obvious because they were sitting behind a waterfall. Brilliant. Maybe one day you will be a guru too. Puthik told the air nomad cheerful cheerfully. Then he grew serious. This chakra deals with pleasure and is blocked by guilt, he told the two of them. Now, look at all the guilt which burdens you so. What do you blame yourself for? Aang closed his eyes and saw orange-tinted visions of what he did. I ran away, he said as he watched the memory of him running away from the southern air temple. 
He saw what had happened at General Fong's fortress when he was in the Avatar state. I hurt all of those people. Gara saw his past as well, seeing it all tinted with orange. I had caused them so much pain, he said as he watched the people of Suna looking at him with scared expressions when he was a child. Another appeared before him, one where he was still a child, but would kill anyone that earned his ire. I have too much blood on my hands. Accept the reality that these things happened, Puthig told the two of them. But do not let them cloud and poison your energy. If the two of you are to be positive influences on the world, you need to forgive yourselves. Both Aang and Gara were able to do that, silently surprised by how easy it was, making them hear ringing chimes again. Location, Chameleon Bay This bay leads directly to the outskirts of Ba Sing Se, Hakoda told Saka. We've been using these tangle mines to stop the Fire Nation ships from getting through. He looked at the mine that he and his son were sitting in front of while Akela sat by Saka's side. Your father invented tangle mines himself, but Toe told Saka as he filled up the mine. Once he was done, he walked away. Saka looked over the mine. Destructive, buoyant, and... He took a sniff, which made him gag, Akela was smart enough to not try and smell what was in the mine. Horrible smell, he finished. Very perceptive, Hakoda praised his son. The mines are filled with skunk fish and seaweed. He placed the top on the mine, closing it. When a ship detonates the mine, the seaweed tangles up the propeller, and the fall smell forces people to abandon the ship. He used his machete to scrap off the remaining mix. I call it the stink and sink. Saka la laughed. Good one, Dad. You're definitely your father's son, Bato said nearby, rolling his eyes. Akela nodded in agreement with the older tribesmen, even though no one saw him do it. A water tribe warrior ran up. Hakoda, our scouts have spotted four Fire Nation ships. He told his chief. Hakoda stood up. Bato, get these mines loaded up. The rest of you men, prepare for battle. He ordered his warriors. They all ran off to do what they were ordered. Ah. Uh. What should I do, Dad? Saka asked, still sitting on the beach. Even though he had be tried and tested, he still felt like a kid who wanted to be a man. Aren't you listening? His father asked back. I said the rest of you men get ready for battle. He brightened up when he heard those words, happy to hear his father treat him like a warrior. He stood up, nodded once, and ran off to prepare, Akela on his heels. Location, Ba Sing Se. Zuko and Iroh stood at the back of their new restaurant, watching customers come in. Who thought when we came to this city as refugees, that I'd end opening my own tea shop? Iroh asked his nephew. Follow your passions, Zuko, and life will reward you. Congratulations, uncle, Zuko told him. I'm very thankful. You deserve it. The Jasmine Dragon will be the best tea shop in the city. With the way the customers were coming, that was going to be absolutely true, very soon. No, I'm thankful because you decided to share this special day with me. It means more than you know. He placed a hand on Zuko's shoulder. Zuko gave him a hug in response. Now let's make these people some tea. He declared before walking to the back. Iroh st stared at him and again, he saw the young Zuko for an instant. Yes, let's make some tea. He agreed, following his nephew to the back. Location, Eastern Air Temple. Pothic, Aang and Gara sat on a ledge, watching the sun rise. Third is the fire chakra, located in the stomach, Pothic said to the two of them. My fire chakra would like to eat something other than onion banana juice, Ng said, holding his stomach. He was hungry and that stuff wasn't really cutting it. Gara, on the other hand, didn't say a word. Puthik chuckled. Good one. He told the air nomad. Moving on, his tone became serious. This chakra deals with willpower and is blocked by shame. 
What are you ashamed of? What are your biggest disappointments in yourself? Ang meditated and saw a yellow-tinted vision of when he tried to learn firebending from Zhang Zhang and what happened due to his impatience. I'm never going to firebend again, he declared. I can't. You will never find balance if you deny this part of your life, the guru told him. You are the avatar and therefore, you are a firebender. Aang did indeed open the fire chakra, but it did ring out a chime. Instead, it sounded like a soft whisper. Hmm, that chakra opened less like a flowing creek and more like a burping bison. Puthik noted. Aang then proceeded to burp, loudly. Tastes like onions and bananas, he said. But strangely something else, pickles? Puthik just shrugged. He turned to look at Gara. And what are you ashamed of, young Kazekage? He asked. What Gara saw was the villagers avoiding him, his siblings staying away from due to fear, his father giving him only looks of disappointment. I've caused them so much grief, he muttered as he looked at the yellow-tinted memories. And yet, they have forgiven you for what you did. You protected them from dangers many would run from. Let your shame flow away. Gara concentrated, letting his shame drift away. They heard ringing chimes again. That's more like it, Puthik told him with approval. Location, B.S. Sing, Sing Se. Two Dai Li agents slid down on the columns, listening in on what the Kyoshi warriors were talking about. I'm tired of wearing this girly disguise, my said as she sat on the steps. I don't know how anyone can fight in this. Maybe that's why it was so easy to beat the Kyoshi warriors and take their clothes, Tai Li suggested as she practiced her chi blocking. How much longer do we have to serve the Earth King? The knife wielder asked aloud. If I have to clean up one more pile of bear poop, I'm going to throw up. Princess Azula promised we would go back to the Fire Nation as soon as we capture the Avatar. We just have to be patient. The acrobat started to practice her acrobatic movements. Shush up. My ordered, standing up. Do you want the whole palace to know we're Fire Nation? Sorry. She instantly apologized. The two agents shared a look and began to climb back up the columns. What they didn't know was that in the shadows of the columns behind them was Azula. Good work, girls, she said. I'm sure the Daily will deliver the message. Location, Eastern Air Temple. Puthik led Aang and Gara to a ruined building where statues of past air nomad nuns stood. The fourth chakra is located in the heart, he told the two of them. It deals with love and is blocked by grief. Lay all your grief out in front of you. Aang looked at a statue of an air nomad with sad eyes before closing them. He mediated and saw his people appear before him in a landscape tinted green. He smiled, but the smile turned into shock when they disappeared into plumes of smoke. You have indeed felt a great loss, Puthik's voice said as it echoed around him. But love is a form of energy and it swirls all around us. The air nomads reappeared, reappeared, floating in the air. The smoke lifted Aang up into the air as well. The air nomad's love for you has not left this world. It is still inside of your heart and is reborn in the form of new love. The smoke created by the air nomads began to coalesce together to form a face. To be more specific, it formed Katara's face. Let the pain flow away. The chimes rang again and Aang opened his eyes, tears of joy flowing freely. Very good, Puthik told him. He wiped the tears away. Can I have some onion and banana juice, please? He asked. For some reason, he was slowly beginning to like the stuff. Of course, but first. The guru turned to look at Gara. You say that you have caused people grief. But what has caused you grief? What Gara saw was his family when they were younger, along with his father and his uncle. They were afraid of me, and for good reason, the Kazekage said as he looked at his family, all tinted green. You felt that your father was disappointed in you, 
and that your uncle tried to kill because of your mother, Puthik told him. But even if they did not care for you, your brother and sister did. And in turn, so did the people of your village. Do not let the memories of your father and uncle trouble you any more. let them drift away. It was difficult, but he managed to do so. They did not hear the chimes when he did, but the soft whisper instead. Is that hard to let them go? Aang asked him. Despite what they did to me, they are my father and uncle. I cannot help but love and remember them, he replied. His voice was quiet as he spoke. And there is what the air chakra is about, Puthik told him. He led the two to a room that was dominated by a giant statue of an air nomad woman. The fifth in the chain is the sound chakra, located in the throat. It deals with truth and is blocked by lies. The ones we tell ourselves. Aang closed his eyes and saw a vision-tinted sky blue of when Katara asked him that one question. Why didn't you tell us you were the Avatar? Because I never wanted to be, he said. He never wanted to be the Avatar. He just wanted to be another air nomad, hanging out with his friends and exploring the world. You cannot lie about your own nature, Puthik told him. You must accept that you are the Avatar. What? What Gara saw was the time at the Kanoha hospital, when he was about to kill Lee. Naruto and Shikamaru had stopped him. The words he said came back to him. I live solely for myself. I love only myself. I was a fool, he muttered. What he had said that day now sounded completely idiotic to him now. Only if you think so, Puthik said. But if what you thought about yourself was true, why did you stay in the village? Surely, you would have left the village in order to kill more people so you could prove your existence? The fact that you had stayed shows that you had lied. But you haven't lied to yourself in a while, have you? Both Aang and Gara closed their eyes and accepted the truth. Aang saw a vision of him standing on a mountain cliff, looking down on the land and ready to protect it. Gara saw himself standing on top of the Kazekage building looking at the village he swore to lead, serve and protect. Both visions were tinted with the color of a clear sky. The chimes rang again. Very good, you too, Puthik said. You have opened the chakra of truth. He led them outside the temple. They sat on a curving staircase on the side of the mountain. The sixth pool of energy is the light chakra, located in the center of the forehead, he told them. It deals with insight and is blocked by illusion. The greatest illusion of this world is the illusion of separation. Things you think are separate and different are actually one and the same. Like the four nations, Aang said. Or the elemental countries, Gara said. Yes, Puthik acknowledged. We are all one people, but we live as if divided. We're all connected, Aang said to himself coming to realize what he was talking about. Everything is connected. That's right. Even the separation of the four elements is an illusion. If you open your mind, you will see that all the elements are one. Four parts of the same whole. Even metal is just a part of earth that has been purified and refined. Location, Earth Kingdom. Toph stood in the metal cage, hitting the sides and the roof, so she could feel the vibrations of it. Finally, she felt the traces of earth within the metal. She smiled and then took a deep breath. She took an earth-bending stance and struck the side of the cage. Come on, metal, she growled. Budge. She struck the metal again, this time causing a dent. Woo. Toph, you rule. She threw another punch at the side of the cage. Location, Ba Sing Se. Katara, Momo, Shu Yi, and Tima Suma walked by the Jasmine Dragon. What do you say, guys? Katara asked the group. Let's get a cup of tea before we get back to the king. They were in no hurry. I don't think that's a good idea, Shu Yi said. We should probably get right back to the Earth King. The sooner they did that, the better. 
She's right, Asuma agreed. These scrolls need to be delivered ASAP. Oh, come on, Sensei, Choji said. It won't hurt to take a small break. Yeah, it's just one cup of tea, Ino pitched in. We have plenty of time. Asuma thought it over. Fine, we can stop for a small break, he conceded. Everyone else, except for Shikamaru, who didn't care, cheered slightly at the small victory. They walked up to the entrance. Table for seven, please, Katara told a nearby waitress. They waited nearby. As they waited, Team Asuma checked the place. It was certainly busy, if the number of customers was anything to go by. Uncle. Called out Zuko as he walked through the tea shop, holding a tray in his hands. I need two jasmines, one green and one lychee. I'm brewing as fast as I can. Iroh replied from the back, also holding a tray. Katara. Katara just looked at the two of them with a stunned expression before bolting out of the restaurant. Katara, wait. Shuyi shouted, going after her and Momo. What's wrong? She asked as she caught up with the waterbender. Those two men were Prince Zuko and his uncle. Katara told her. We have to get back to the palace. Shuyi grabbed Katara's arm and sped up, leaving a dust trail behind them as they ran to the palace. Team Asuma watched in surprise as the two girls ran off. They were about to follow when a man playing Pai Show at a nearby table spoke, getting their attention. Oh my, did she see something that surprised her? He asked, looking at Team Asuma. Team Asuma looked at the man. His hair may have been black, but his eyes were the kind of blue that belonged to only one person they knew. Naruto, Asuma said. Hello, Kanoha Shinobi, he greeted them mockingly. Did you enjoy the show? What are you doing here? Ino demanded. Why does that always seem to be the first question out of your mouths? He asked them with slight exasperation. Try something that's a little more original. But to answer your question, I am enjoying a cup of tea and playing a friendly game of pie show. Speaking of which, he moved a piece on the board. I win. Another game? Asked the other person. Sure. They began to rearrange the pieces, ready to start again. Why are you still here? He asked Team Asuma when he saw they were still there, looking at him. You should go after those girls. Who knows? They just might run into a nasty surprise. Team Asuma shared a look of horror before running out of the tea shop. Location, Eastern Air Temple. Night had fallen and the stars were out in their full glory. Puthik, Aang and Gara sat on the roof of the temple, so they could see all the stars. Stars. This is the last chakra, isn't it? Aang asked. Yes, Puthik answered. Once you open this chakra, you will be able to go in and out of the avatar state at will, and when you are in the avatar state, you will have complete control and awareness of all your actions. Let's do this. He declared. Gara nodded silently. The thought chakra is located at the crown of the head, the guru told the two of them. It deals with pure cosmic energy and is blocked by earthly attachments. Mediate on what attaches you to this world. Aang saw images of Katara while Gara saw images of his friends, family, and his village, both were tinted violent. Now, let all of those attachments go. Let them flow down the river, forgotten. Aang snapped out of his mediation when he heard those words. What? Why would I let go of Katara? He asked. I, I love her. Learn to let her go, or you cannot let the pure cosmic energy flow in from the universe, Puthik told him. Why would I choose cosmic energy over Katara? How could it be a bad thing that I feel an attachment to her? He demanded. Three chakras ago, that was a good thing. You must learn to let go, Puthik told him sternly. 
They then heard the ringing chimes and saw that Gara had opened his eyes. I have never seen someone open the seventh chakra so easily. Even Mito had difficulty with it, the guru said with slight wonder in his voice. I had once thought I existed for myself and only for myself, Gara replied. You had wanted me to return to that same line of thinking. The only difference is that I returned with a positive look instead of a negative look. An interesting way to open it. The guru stood up from where he sat. Eng, I want you to stay here and think on your attachments. I have one last thing to teach to Gara. He led the shinobi off the roof and into the temple. They walked through the empty halls and corridors that showed the ruined st state they were in. Eventually, they came to a room that only held a large mirror on the opposite wall. Why are we here? Gara asked as he quickly looked around. It wasn't a big room and its only defining feature was the mirror before him. We are here so you can open the eighth chakra, Puthik answered his question. But you said that there were only seven chakras. The Kazekage remembered that part of the conversation back at the creek. Do you remember when you realized that the seven chakras are similar to the eight gates? Gara nodded. That is true from a certain point of view. However, the chakras and the eight gates are the same. The guru told him. But the eight gates are not located where the seven chakras are. He remembered his lessons on the location of the eight gates. They were nowhere near where the seven chakras were. Remember your basic lessons in chakra, Puthik reminded him. It comes from both the physical energy that is in every cell of your body and from the spiritual energy gained from exercise and experience. The location of the eight gates is the physical side and the location of the eight chakras is the spiritual side. The earth chakra is the gate of opening. The water chakra is the gate of healing and so on. Are you ready? He fell silent for a moment and then he nodded. Yes, I am ready. He sat down in front of the mirror and looked upon himself. The eighth chakra is the mirror chakra, known to Shinobi as the gate of death, located in the eyes, Puthik began. It deals with acceptance and is blocked by denial. You must be able to accept who you are and what you have been. Look deep inside yourself and find the shadow of Shikaku. Gara closed and concentrated, trying to reach that level of depth. Visions of what he had seen before guided his way, the colors intermixing with one another. A part of him wanted to stop, but he pressed onwards. When the last vision showed itself to him, he opened his eyes again and saw nothing but darkness. That was all he could see, darkness. It felt like he was standing in a void. Well, look who it is, a voice echoed all around him. The Kazekage himself, I'm honored. Show yourself, Shikaku, Gara commanded. He knew the voice well enough to know who it was talking. Footsteps were heard coming towards him. Out of the darkness, another Gara appeared. This was different because of the crazed grin he wore, and that his eyes were not green, but gold. Is that any way to speak to your mother? Shikaku asked him. You are not my mother. He was a fool to even think of such a thing. But then again, he had no actual mother when he grew up, he only had Shikaku. You were the one calling me that. His gaze hardened. That is, until you forsook me. I had to rely on my power, not on yours. He wanted to be a shinobi people could depend on, not a Jinchuriki they would all live in fear of. You abandoned me. Shikaku accused him, his voice screaming into the void. But he wasn't affected by the scream that seemed to echo all around them. I did not abandon you, he replied. The Akatsuki extracted you from me. You're but a shadow of Shikaku. The shadow rushed forward and grabbed Gara by the throat. You think because you've opened the chakras, you'll be able to banish me? You'll never be rid of me. I will always be there to plague your dreams. I won't fade away. He screamed, lifting the Kazekage into the air. 
Again, the scream echoed in the void. And again, he wasn't affected by it. I know, because I will not allow you to fade away. His simple reply stunned Shikaku. W what are you saying? He asked as his grip on Gara's throat loosened. The red head landed on his feet easily enough and faced the shadow. When I first came to this temple, I wanted to get rid of you so I could be free of past memory memories he said. But I now realize that if I were to do that, I would be denying a part of myself. I must be able to accept everything about me, which includes my past and you. You may just be a shadow of Shikaku, but you are still Shikaku. You are a part of me. So, I accept you. What you are and what you will be. So, you'll just accept me? After all I've done to you? Tears began to well up in Shikaku's eyes. Why? Because I can, he answered. Thank you, Shikaka said before he disappeared. What Gara heard this time was not chimes ringing, but a bell tolling. He opened his eyes and looked at himself in the mirror. He couldn't say how, but he looked different somehow. Congratulations, Gara, Puthik said. You have opened the last chakra and have made peace with yourself. I have nothing left to teach you. He stood up and faced the guru. Thank you, Guru Puthik. He bowed to the man. You're welcome, young Kazekage. He returned the bow. I have to get back to Aang and see what his decision is. Very well, I will go back to my brother and my sister. They walked out of the room and parted ways. As Gara made his way down to where his siblings were, he looked around. Everything looked a little different and yet, they were the same as before. Maybe it had to do with what changed within him. He was silent when he finally made it to where Tamari and Kankuro sat next to Appa. Got any three? Kankuro asked his sister, holding cards in his hands. Go fish, Tamari told him, also holding cards. Damn it. Now I know you're cheating. He accused her. Ever since they had started playing, most of what he got out of her was go fish, and it had finally gotten to him. No, I'm not. She protested angrily. Is this because Gara and I walked in on you and Shikamaro? The puppeteer Shinobi asked her. Is that why you're always cheating now? Oh, will you just that go already? That was old news and the two of them would still not, not let it go. Let it go? He repeated. We walked in on our half-naked sister straddling Shikamura Nara and trying to take his shirt off. Well, you should have. She stopped when they heard footsteps coming towards them. They turned to see Gara coming up the steps. Tamari, Kankuro, he greeted them. Gara, is everything okay? Kankuro asked. His brother looked, different somehow. Everything is fine. I've opened all the chakras and have come to terms with Shikaka's shadow, he told them. I can finally sleep peacefully. That's great, Tamari congratulated her brother. Do you feel any different? Like Kankuro, she could see that he looked different. He walked over to Appa and climbed atop the sleeping sky bison. I feel a little tired. I think I'll. He never finished the sentence because once his head touched Appa's fur, he was out like a light. Tamari and Kankuro continued their game quietly. They weren't going to begrudge their little brother a peaceful sleep. Location, Ba Sing Se. Katara ran into the throne room, Shu Yi right behind her. They noticed the three Kyoshi warriors kneeling in front of the throne. Thank goodness you're here, Suki, Katara said. Wait, princess. That's not. Shuyi tried to tell her, but Katara continued, ignoring her. Something terrible is going on. The Fire Nation has infiltrated the city, the waterbender told who she thought was Suki. Not only have we seen the Fire Nation paragon, but I just saw Prince Zuko and his uncle. We have to tell the Earth King right away. Suki stood up and walked forward. 
Oh, don't worry. I'll be sure to let him know, she said, her gold eyes gleaming in the light. That's not Suki. Shuyi finally said. Momo screeched and flew away. Katara was about to attack when Tai Li leapt at her and Shuyi, blocking their chi and knocking them out. They both fell to the floor unconscious, Katara landing in the water from her pouch. Not bad for a circus freak, right? Tai Li asked the unconscious waterbender. What? Got nothing to say. When she had heard that insult at the back of the drill, she had been enraged. And now, she had delivered payback. That's enough, Tai Li, Azula told her as she and Mai stood over the two unconscious girls. So, Zuzu's in the city too? I think it's time for a little family reunion. They didn't notice the flying lemur escaping, nor did they notice the four shadows at the throne room door. Location, Eastern Air Temple. Puthik rejoined Aang on the roof, having left Gara to go back to his family. I've thought about my attachments, Aang told the guru as he sat back down. And? Asked Puthik. I'm sorry, but I can't let go of Katara. He just couldn't. Aang, to master the avatar state, you must open all the chakras, the old man told him. Surrender yourself. The choice weighed on him. It was either the avatar state or Katara. And he knew what he had to do. Okay, I'll try. He closed his eyes and once again saw an image of Katara. Now think of your attachments and let them go, Puthik's voice told him. Let the pure cosmic energy flow. The image of Katara disappeared and he found himself standing on bridge of light above the world. Looking at where the bridge went to, he saw a larger image of himself, the eyes and tattoos glowing white while everything else was black. He knew that this was the form of the avatar state. He walked forward and his own tattoos began to glow. The avatar state lowered itself to him and placed its hands on either side of him, encasing him in an orb of purple energy. It was going well, until he heard a famili familiar scream. Turning his head, he saw a vision of Katara in chains, demanding to be let go. He ran out of the orb, dissipating it, and ran onto the bridge, making the avatar state disappear as well as the glowing of his tattoos. The bridge followed suit, disappearing under his feet and sending him falling to the planet. He snapped his eyes open. Katara's in danger. He said, standing up. I have to go. He leapt off the roof and went down the side. No, Aang. Puthik said, stopping him at the edge. By choosing attachment, you have locked the chakra. If you leave now, you won't be able to go into the avatar state at all. He hesitated for a second, but continued on, leaving behind a disappointed Puthik. He ran all the back down to where Appa and the three shinobi were. He woke Appa up and flew them away from the Eastern Air Temple. Location, Earth Kingdom. They continued to drive the cart during the night. They stopped when they heard a loud noise coming from the back. Stopping the cart and going to investigate, they discovered the cage holding Toph had a giant hole in it. It's another one of her tricks. Master you declared. There's a giant hole in the box. Xin Fu replied. How is that a trick? It's not. Toph declared from behind them. It's the real deal. She then bent the earth to jut out two walls from the ground. She then bent the two walls together, catching Master Yu and Xi and Fu together, and then bent the walls into pushing them into the cage. She then leapt at the hole and bent the metal shut, sealing her two captors inside. I am the greatest earthbender in the world. She declared after jumping to the top of the cage. Don't you two dunderheads ever forget it. She leapt off the cage and began to earth surf away, heading back to Ba Sing Se. I'm going to be stuck in here forever with you, aren't I? Xi and Fu asked Master, Master Yu. They crammed into the cage and couldn't really move. I have to go to the bathroom, Master Yu finally said. Xi and Fu just banged his head on the metal. Metal. Location, Chameleon Bay. 
Saka was just finished gearing up when Hakoda walked up to him and Akela. Ready to go knock some Fire Nation heads? He asked. You don't know how much this means to me, Dad, Saka replied, standing up. I'll make you proud and I'll finally prove to you what a great warrior I am. He placed a hand on his son's shoulder. Saka, you don't have to prove anything to me. I'm already proud of you, and I've always known you were a great warrior. Really? Why do you think I trusted you to look after our tribe when I left? He asked his son. I knew you would live to your namesake. Saka was confused by what his father said. My namesake, what are you talking about? You were named after the first water tribe Paragon. From what your grandfather said around the fire, he was both a great warrior and a great strategist. Hakoda told him. From what Bato has told me, and from what I've heard, you've certainly done well in both. He was silent for a minute as he went through what he had just heard. Well, that's ironic, he finally said. What do you mean? His father asked. He pulled the Paragon medallion out of his shirt to show him, the implication was clear. Hakoda looked at the medallion, looked at his son, looked back at the medallion, and then laughed. That is ironic. Saka joined in the laughter. Once they were done, they made their way to the ship when Akela turned around and started barking. Saka turned to see what the problem was, only to see Appa land in front of them. This can't be good news, he said when he saw Aang's concerned look. After learning about Katara's predicament, Saka and Akela boarded Appa, who then took off. As they flew away, Saka looked back at the sailing ships. Hakoda looked back at the sky bison and smiled. Location, Ba Sing Se. Two Dai Li agents led Azula towards Long Feng's prison cell. What is this about? She demanded as they entered the cell. Your agents show up in the middle of the night and drag me down here? You will not treat a Kyoshi warrior this way. But you're not a Kyoshi warrior, are you? Long Feng asked, standing up. Isn't that right, Princess Azula of the Fire Nation? She went still for a moment when she heard those words. It was rather foolish of you to come here without your bodyguard. Where is the Fire Nation Paragon? I don't need him at my side constantly, she replied angrily. I'm capable of handling myself, despite what he thinks. She made it sound like he was holding her back. Of course you are, he replied with condescending sarcasm. What do you want? I want to make a deal, he told her. It's time I regained control of Ba Sing Se, and you have something I need. Oh? The Earth King's trust. Why should I help you? Because I can get you the avatar, he said, walking closer to her. I'm listening. He smirked. What a foolish girl. He had her right where he wanted her. Zuko and Iroh were closing up shop when a courier entered. A message from the royal palace, he told Iroh, handing him a scroll and leaving. Iroh opened the scroll and read it. I, I can't believe it. He said in stunned surprise. What is it, uncle? Zuko asked as he walked up to him, wanting to see what the message said. It's great news. We've been invited to serve tea to the Earth King. His uncle told him before running off to the kitchen. Zuko just smiled and continued to sweep the dust away. His smile faltered when he looked out to the city and thought that the blue spirit was watching him from a nearby roof. He blinked and the blue spirit was gone. But he didn't like what the chill creeping up his spine that came afterwards. That's it for this reading. Hit like and subscribe for a free ticket pass going to the different worlds of anime fanfictions. Looking forward to having you on board again.